everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more transformative, meaningful, and inclusive for their students. Uh, today we're continuing this series of amazing conversations I'm having with people in the history and heritage field about how or if they see history and the teaching of history changing after this moment. And um, today we have another amazing guest. Uh, Dr. Nathan Smith is a, a history consultant for his company Applied History. He's also a history professor at university and college level and I think that his perspective teaching at a college level is really going to add a lot of dimension to this conversation so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Nathan is also a writer, a editor, another renaissance man and has done uh, so many different projects that um, I'm sure that you have seen his hand in, uh, especially related to the World War I commemoration that went from 1914 to 1918, as I'm sure you know. Uh, anyway, let's go over to Nathan. I have a cat at my feet. I have a feeling she's going to make an appearance during the video, but we'll see. Um, okay, let's bring it over to Nathan. Hi everyone, a real quick post-interview note before you actually watch the interview. Uh, Nathan and I had more of a conversation than an interview, so our screens are side by side rather than just like his screen and my screen. What that means is that I wasn't able to add text at the bottom of the screen in a way that doesn't like block out one of our faces. Um, so anyway, just know that, that that's missing from this video because of the, the way that we have the video structured. But a cat does show up and look very grumpy. So, you know, that's, uh, that's something to look for. Anyway, enjoy. It was such a great interview. Hi, Nathan. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. I know that you are so busy with your consulting work and your teaching work. Um, and it's been such a struggle for so many of us to kind of figure this new timing and this new world out. So thank you so much for, for making time to talk to with me today. Oh, happy to be here. Hi, Samantha. <laughs> Hi. So with everyone, we have been uh, talking about three different questions, kind of like the present, future, and perhaps the like imagining or community part of what could happen with this moment. So let's just dive right in. Um, so I have personally thought of history differently because of what we're going through now. Mm. Um, it's really made me think of things like, like affect and emotion and how how our historical record is really like imperfect in in kind of capturing that. Um, have you thought of history any differently? So many people I spoke spoke to, especially history professors, have said not necessarily. But mm. uh, have you thought of history any differently because of this moment? I guess I haven't. Like overall, I haven't thought of history as as something different. But what you just said about thinking about different um, themes, thinking about emotion, thinking about affect. Um, I think the times that you live in do make you emphasize aspects of the past or make you think about topics or approaches to um, thinking about the past in different ways. So it certainly has made me think about, um, you know, other times in the past um, uh, where there has been a lot of anxiety in society. Uh, a lot of the commentary you read in, in, um, in the news reporting journalism and whatnot um, are things like the uh, the flu epidemic in, in 1919, um, the influenza, uh, and also crises in the past. Um, a lot of the, the, the articles I've been looking at uh, from Toronto media have been talking about the world wars and, and uh, mm. uh, how government um, should be approaching uh, the, the management of this crisis. So it does make me think about those sorts of things. Um, as a way of emphasizing themes about the past, but it hasn't made me think about history as as something different or imagining history in a different way. I want to pick up something that you said at the beginning, and I want to know if I am hearing what you said right. Uh, and if I'm not, then maybe you'll still agree with it. But like how our current moment makes us or really shapes the way we think of the past, which mm -hmm. then makes me think of like, how so how so much of our history is really a reflection of the present because we're pulling yeah. out of the past that 
yeah. help us understand this moment. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think so. I think definitely um, the, the, the topics that we choose to write about, I think as historians and what teachers uh, often choose to emphasize um, is often influenced from the, uh, by the present. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I, I think we want to explain the present and talk about why the past is, is relevant for it. I know that I definitely do it in teaching Canadian history. Um, a couple of years ago, the, the Prime Minister um, issued an official apology for the, uh, the rejection of the, uh, uh, the Saint Louis, the ship um, carrying uh, Jewish refugees from Europe to Canada and to other countries in 1939, which was turned away. Um, and I saw that as a great opportunity to talk about something that happened in the past and the way that it's uh, relevant for the present. And it was in a Canadian studies class in which the issues of um, immigration and multiculturalism were really big themes in, in the class. So that's one example of the way that the present, I think, can shape the way that we teach history. Yeah, I, I also, I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think that it's important in this moment. And maybe I guess that's what I mean when I think of, that I think of, I've been thinking of history differently because of this. Maybe the, how subjective our history is, like it mm. helps us understand how our histories are not objective. And so to, rather than to kind of go closer to objectivity, but to really understand that subjectivity of yeah. the moment that we're in and how and what we teach. You know, one thing I think it does is um it makes in the present it, it makes um a far larger part of society think about society because the way that um our, our lives have changed um in, in part have changed because of the uh of the disease that, that you know society is experiencing um it's forced government to take action to make you know all the different levels of government in in canada uh, to take action. Uh, um, some of them are recommendations, you know, other than others are legal uh, regulations that we have to abide by. It's forced, I think, then um, for a much larger uh, proportion of society to think about how society is structured, to think about the role of government, and to think about relations uh, between individuals in society, which we wouldn't normally think about. So, to that extent, I think that really is different. We don't normally, I think, I mean, we're accustomed to thinking about it because uh, uh, we teach uh, histories of Canadian society or maybe some other courses that, that are uh, similar to that. And often our research, I think, is, is related to those questions too. So I'm used to it and I, I find it a challenge in, in classrooms to get students to think about not only their own perspectives or some sort of mainstream kind of ways of things, seeing things, but try to think about society overall, the connections between individuals, the different ways that we can organize society, and to, to also think about the role that government um, uh, plays in society. I think it definitely makes us think about that a lot more right now. You know, this really reminds me of the conversation I had with Dr. Sean Carlton last week about, you know, he said that um, these moments of crisis really show you how the structures work and yeah. he was saying in particular this is really showing how a nation-to-nation -nation relationship um, between the Canadian government and uh, different Indigenous peoples uh, fail to hold the weight that it, sh it should um, and so I appreciate you also saying that about we understand our structures differently because we are seeing how they operate or how they how they fail to operate as effectively as as we might want them to in these times. I think even more fundamentally, we're just more aware of them. Right, know? right. You know, we're just more aware of them. So, I, I totally agree with with um, with with that view that you just um, expressed. Uh, um, disaster or crisis uh, reveals fault lines in society, reveals tensions that exist in society. Uh, so I think we're definitely seeing that the, um, you know, like if you're just to take a class perspective on the effects of, um, of dealing with uh, the coronavirus, it's clearly um, uh, something that falls in terms of risk, uh, falls more heavily on uh, uh, people who are frontline workers um, and, you know, people with lower incomes that don't have as many 
uh, options about uh, uh, self-isolating and uh, uh, things like that. So it very quickly, it doesn't take very long, does it, uh, before we start seeing those realities. In right. Um, Once they're already there, but we just notice them. Right. They, it's, so, <laughs> so I was saying to Chris Sanigan, who's an archivist and comic book creator, when he was talking about um, archiving, uh, like what this is going to mean for the archives mm. community, I was like, I want to bring in postmodern theory, but I'm going to bring it in right now because Foucault says that we should really strive for a messy history because that is more mm. aligned with how society functions. And with what you're saying and what Sean was saying, I also think of Derrida's notion of deconstruction, that it's not just pulling things apart, but rather deconstruction is is watching the fault lines that are already there. Um, mm -hmm. What is going to come out from those fault lines? Um, I mean, we don't need to go into a big post post-structural discussion, but I actually, just as an aside, I think that might be an interesting thing to do for the video because it is coming a lot, up a lot. This notion of messiness, this notion of structures crumbling, this notion of seeing a different world because um, because of this this fault line, because of this crisis. So mm. I just throwing that out there, a little plug yeah. for modern history. <laughs> um, I feel like you kind of touched upon this, but do you think, do you think the teaching of history will shift after this in, in, in big ways? Do you think that this kind of revealing of fault lines will, will be present in the classroom? Do you think that it will? Do you think that it should? I mean, just based on the people I know who teach history at the college and university level, uh, I think they would choose to to use this. Um, for examples in the classroom, that there would be a point of, uh, it would be a touchstone that they can use with students um, to make comparisons uh, with things that happened in the past or realities from the past. Certainly anybody teaching uh, sociology or social science, um, which are topics I've, I've taught at, uh, at college, um, it's a great way of reflecting on social structure and um, social relations. Uh, so I think that's true for history classrooms also. In terms of what uh, teachers choose to um, uh, teach about the past, I don't know if it, it, it will change, but I think it's a subject matter and a shared experience that teachers can draw on and uh, uh, use that to teach you know other things that they're, that they're interested in. I mean, in the, you know, we don't really know exactly where this is going. <laughs> in the next few months, but um, uh, I guess my sense is, is that it won't lead to a transformative sort of uh, approach um, to what uh, teachers choose to, to teach in history classrooms. On the other hand, it might change a lot about how um, teachers choose to teach because um, uh, so much of uh, teaching in the immediate future is now online. Um, there's a possibility that there will be more of that in the future. And I don't have any predictions to make about that, but um, that's always been of interest, right, to uh, education institutions. There, there's always been an interest in providing online instruction. There's a, a great hope that it's uh, um, a, a technique that, that uh, can be more cost effective, but also a way to reach students. Um, uh, I'm a lot more skeptical about that. I think it's extremely useful, but I don't see it as any kind of a replacement for face-to-face uh, -face teaching. I've done online teaching too, and I, there's things I really like about it. Um, so I, I see that question that you're asking in two ways. I see the what teachers choose to teach uh, and how they choose to teach it. I'm not sure the what is gonna change overall, although obviously this is a, a collective experience that we all have that we can draw on and, and make use of. Uh, but the how of how teaching happens in the near future has completely changed. Um, and <laughs> maybe down the road Whether it's going to Whether you wanted to or not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to maybe challenge you a little bit that the content won't change because also you're saying that like there might be more opportunities to bring in these current events. And I think that 
if you're bringing that in, would that then shift how you're demonstrating particular elements of history or, or you don't necessarily see those two things happening hand in hand? I, I guess I, I think about if I'm say teaching uh, uh, about social inequality in the past, um, I, I mean, there's lots of different uh, topics that reveal that in, in Canadian history. Um, you could draw on this experience that, that we're having in, in 2020 uh, that demonstrates social inequality in our own society. For my own teaching, that's not a new topic, right? right. So, but drawing on that shared experience, uh, drawing on uh, examples or, you know, anyway, themes that, that students will be more familiar with because they lived through it, um, I think would be a really good technique uh, to, to make use of, to, to engage students. But the topic itself, for the kind of teaching I do, and I imagine for a lot of teachers too, Yeah, uh, yeah. not so much. Um, I, so I, one of the first conversations I had was with Dr. Mary Chek Sears, who I know that you know yeah. very well. And, you know, she was saying that because the mode of teaching history is going to change, that also then for her at least changes some of the the structure of her teaching because yeah. she can't do everything and so yeah. really talked about like a co-creation of some of the content this isn't one of the like official questions but do you want to comment a little bit about how some yeah. of your teaching has changed because it's moved online yeah, I think that's a good point, and I think that probably does overlap with the question of um, uh, how teaching changes. You can't translate face-to-face uh, -face teaching exactly to, to online. There's all kinds of parallels. Almost any issue in the classroom exists in an online in environment, uh, but it gets dealt with in different ways. So I think one reality of the online, for example, is uh, it's possible to produce an online class for a very large class, right, with numerous students. Um, but you don't get any, it would be extremely difficult to get interaction, um, uh, teacher to student and student to student interaction in a class like that. Um, so ideally, I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't want that kind of class online. Um, uh, uh, very large groups, um, I think, would produce a, a sort of a learning experience where basically it's content um, uh, on the screen that students have to interpret uh, and then report on in assignments and they get graded. We don't want that. We want to be able to engage yeah, with yeah. students. So uh, creating um, um, ways of doing that um, uh, can take a, a great deal of time to create um, interesting experiences that students can access online and, and have some discussion between themselves and some with the teacher as well. Um, so I think Mary is right that, that um, it, it will cause us, if we continue with this online approach, it will cause us to craft our way of introducing topics and getting students to think about topics. Um, I, I think it will push us to try to create those sorts of uh, um, discussion assignments and learning activity assignments that then lead to uh, their own, you know, written assignments and, and reading that they do, rather than say talking, right, in a, a kind of a lecture and engagement, talking and discussion fashion, um, which I do pretty informally. Uh, but you've got to formalize that and create, um, uh, craft something online that can produce that. That would feel different to me, creating something like that. That That's hard work and you can certainly do it and do a good job of it, but um, it is different. Well, I think for me, that's one of the reasons why I was so, uh, I, I mean, the word confused is coming to me, but that's not really the word that I, I that, that feels right. But that's one of the reasons why I was so confused about this notion of imagining a new we during this time, because mm. I see classroom-based connection as so important to yeah. sharing stories and exploring stories. And I guess my part of my panic was like, what does that look like if we are all in our homes? Because yeah. that is literally siloed thinking, <laughs> right? So, I mean, 
it's a lot of the other um, a lot of the other interviews we had uh, have been very like positive about what that might mean, and uh, it's given me a lot more like hope. Um, yeah. Can you comment about if you think that this notion of imagining a new we or a we or even just this notion of imagination could shift and change because of this moment? Yeah, um, like I said earlier, I have done online teaching. It was some years ago, so um, what I've become a little bit familiar with in the, in the past month is there's a lot more tools available now. Uh, and I think there is a greater recognition from Again, colleges and universities, that's what I'm familiar with. Um, and the fact that uh, uh, the designing of online um, classes requires a lot of people in order to produce something that's good. Mm. Um, uh, so it, anyway, <clears throat> you need to create something that's uh, uh, quite rich uh, and that takes a, a, a great deal of time all of your class design, your your um, assignment design, your content design, learning activities, stuff like that, it's all front end loaded. So it's a huge amount of um, uh, time. You you will spend more time doing that. Uh, and and if, if you produce, um, if something, uh, a good actual online class is produced, it's gonna require the, the assistance of web designers and other content creators to uh, maybe create brief videos of yourself that introduce topics. Um, uh, so it, it's more of a team effort than I think what we're familiar with. And with yet those classroom teaching aren't really like available to us, right? Because everyone is doing this right now. It's not like we can work with a really great team or work with our IT, if, even if yeah. we have those, because I know I mean, this was this was a while ago, but when I was going around to all these different school boards in Ontario, um, some some school boards still all had like overhead projectors in classrooms, and other ones had full like smart boards. You know, yeah. like, um, online teaching it does not look the same for everyone because of notions of access, and I yeah. think that. You know, I think that developing a course always takes a lot of time. But the thing is, we, when we are imagining developing a course, we imagine it in a traditional class setting often. Yes. For so many of us, yeah. do the work of developing a course and then also learning the technology and what would work best for our students is, it, it, you know, is is uh, such a mammoth task and all of us educators right now that have moved to this know that know that that, that way that front end and you know I um, was talking to one uh, I was talking to a student who was saying that her oh, can you just see that cat sorry um, that's saying that one of their online classes were, were interrupted by what is now called zoom bombing of people coming on in masks and um, yelling racist words or like filling oh you're kidding porn. yeah yeah it's crazy and i've mentioned it to other people and people either don't know about it at all or like oh yeah that happens a lot uh and so it's so i i the point i'm trying to to say is that i mean other than like watch for that <laughs> but that we can do all this front loading things but we are never going to know how students are going to react or how this work is going to land and mm -hmm. the formal classroom we can often read the room and know yeah. how to shift but will or how our students respond to this i think will be it will be so interesting to see if we can build a class community because that's that's difficult in an online space i think i don't have a lot of, of experience teaching online but i think it's difficult to build community thoughts on any I of think that? it is I don't, I don't think there's any doubt <laughs> I think it is um yeah one thing that I that I think is also true is is um in an online experience uh, uh, maybe there's more acknowledgement from a student's perspective that they need to commit to actually being in the classroom so to speak mm. uh, uh, I, I'm not saying that that will lead to more commitment uh, necessarily uh, but if people, if students are there, they might be more present. Um, 
uh, while you are, or if they're doing it asynchronously, meaning people log in at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, their choice of when to log in might assist them in being more focused um, on course material rather than a, 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 a traditional classroom where it's, you know, at two o'clock on a Wednesday or whatever. Um, and uh, they can sort of tune out. I'm here, I made it. So this is the commitment I've made. Right, right. And, and uh, if you want to get me, then you got to do something special today because I'm just going <laughs> to... Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. When you're self-directing learning, you can you can self-direct it at your own speed, right? Like, but, I'm, but you're right. I think you're very right about knowing, reading the room. We don't have that um, uh, 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 ability online. So um, I think in all those respects, those are big differences uh, in, in terms of teaching and they apply to any subject, right? Not just history. Yeah. And so it will be interesting about, you know, in the how the summer progresses what or if the the ways we're thinking about history does shift because of the delivery right like the medium is the message and so so i i am really interested in maybe like coming back to some of these conversations to to reflect on how or if because of this this digital teaching but here here's one thing i thought of when when i saw these questions from you is is one thing i think is different about the the online um it's possible to teach in a traditional sort of lecture-based way at university and colleges uh, and do a good job of it, still allow for uh, classroom engagement, um, but deliver really good lectures. Anyway, what you're doing in that circumstance is you're sort of delivering your narrative or at least um, your narrative shapes the, the direction of, uh, of the class. I think producing narrative um, is more difficult in an online uh, uh, environment if you did that, it would it would require a fair bit of text, right? Your own text, uh, or recorded lectures, or something like that. Um, that's not very engaging. If if you got to read, you know, five web pages of text before you get to the learning activity, before you get to the discussion, and then there's still um, readings you have to do for that week and 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 report on. Um, that's not great. Uh, so uh, I think it might reduce that and maybe it does encourage um, a, a different approach uh, in which students are exposed and encouraged to engage with, with some, some issues and, uh, uh, you know, in a few different ways. Um, and then you see what they bring to it. That's possible. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of... That's something that, that Mary had talked about too. So I think that like watching these two videos together is really helpful in thinking about these different these different ways of of translating the type of teaching that we want to do into a a media that we didn't necessarily choose, right? Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing these these perspectives. Yeah. I think it's really useful and. Um, really thought provoking. And again, it's so nice to do so many of these because the conversation just builds on each other. And uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thanks, Samantha. I enjoyed the conversation too. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, we'll say goodbye. I know you got your classes to work on. <laughs> um, so anyway, until next time, uh, see you later. Bye for now. See ya. Bye.